I was supposed to announce who this terrific gentleman is that's coming up on the stage. His name is John Hambright. John, uh, many of you know him, but John's been the pastor uh, for many years at Enon Baptist Church in Morris. And uh, it's just great to have him here filling in for Jeremy this morning. So y'all give him your attention. Thank you so much. It's good to see you here this morning. Did you enjoy the praise and worship time? And the little kids, amen. Aren't they good? If you're young, you'll go, woo, woo, woo. I can't do that. I'm too old now. Boy, it's good to have you here today. If you have your copy of the Word of God, how many of you have a Bible with you today? How many have a red Bible? Oh, yeah. Mine's red. Brenda's is red. Yeah. I read mine every day. <laughs> Makes it read. First Thessalonians chapter four. That's in the New Testament. Several years ago there was an older, older couple about like Terry Don and Ann Harbison. They were way back in the woods. Kind of like Terry Don and Ann Harbison. Sleeping late one night, they had a grandfather clock. That grandfather clock messed up some way or another, and at 12 o'clock at night, it struck 13 times. The old man punched his wife and said, Wake up, honey, it's later than it's ever been before. <laughs> well, you understand that it's later than it's ever been before. There are people who are wondering, what is the next prophetic event on the calendar of God? The next prophetic event on the calendar of God is the rapture of the church. You understand that one day Jesus is going to come again. And when Jesus comes again, he is going to come to carry or to transport the saints of God away. I want to share with you today some interesting things that are written in the word of God that relate to the rapture of the church, the next event on God's prophetic calendar. But I wonder now, would you just bow your heads with me and let's ask God's blessings on this. And if you have a special request while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, just put your hand up, put it right back down, which signifies you can pray for me. Any special prayer request today. Father, in Jesus' name, you are the Lord of all creation. You are the Lord ever, over everything. And Father, we realize that you came to earth 2,000 years ago on what we understand was Christmas morning. But Father gave a promise that you were going to come again. And Father, as we examine that, Lord, I pray that you will bless that and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. When Paul was making his missionary journeys, one of the towns that he went through was the town of Thessalonica. The Bible records that he was only there for three Sabbath days, no more than four weeks, and yet in doing that, he covered all the major doctrines that there were to cover, including the second return of the Lord Jesus Christ. After Paul had left, there were some in Thessalonica that were wondering, what has happened to my loved ones who have died? Have, have they missed out on the coming of Jesus and the rapture of the church? So in 2 Thess 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul begins to write to them about their relationship with Jesus, even though they may be dead. And he said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and he rose again, even so those that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And then the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But of the time and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. You understand that when we talk about the rapture of the church, we're talking about something that is scriptural. You will understand that God did not leave those prophetic events to those that 
uh, read poems or magicians or soothsayers or Ouija boards or fortune cookies or tea leaf readers, necromancers or crystal balls. You understand that God stated it plainly in the word of God. And he gave to us a promise that he would come again. You remember that when Jesus ascended into heaven, there were two angels that were there. And they said to those disciples, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? For this same Jesus which was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Jesus also mentioned to his disciples before he went away, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You understand in these two passages of Scripture, Jesus said that he is going to come again. You understand the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is in two phases. The first phase is what we call the rapture. The rapture is when Jesus comes for the saints. The second phase of his second coming is called the revelation when Jesus reveals himself and then he is going to come again and establish his kingdom on earth. One, he is going to come for the saints. The other one, he is going to come with the saints of God. You understand that when we talk about the rapture of the church, you can search the Bible from cover to cover and you will not find the word rapture. You understand it is not a scriptural word. Neither is Trinity or Sunday school or a lot of those other words that we use. But you understand their concepts are there. You understand it's bound up in the phrase that Paul says that we are going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. It is that phrase caught up. Several times it was used in the Bible. It was used to Philip's in Acts 8, 39. When, Paul, uh, when Philip was caught up and he was transported down to Gaza. You understand that Paul mentioned in 2 Corinthians 12 that he was caught up into a place called paradise. It's the identical same phrase. It's the identical same word. Now the Greek word is harpezo. Now I use this fancy words because we get our English word harpoon from that word. When the Latin people were translating this word out of the Greek into the Latin, they used the word rapia. We get our word rapture from this word. It means that we are going to be transported or we're going to be translated to another place or another sphere of existence. When Paul was writing to the church at Thessalonica, he says, we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up. We're going to be translated to another sphere or another place of existence. You understand that it is scriptural for us to understand that the rapture of the church is something that the writers talked about from the very moment that Christianity began to spread across this world. Jesus, from the time he left, he said, folks, I'm going to come again. I'm going to come in the rapture of the church. I am going to come for the bride of Christ. Not only do you find out that this word is scriptural, but you find out that the rapture is secretive. Now, I'm sure that you probably saw some dramatic presentations of how there is a mom and a dad that slowly lose gravitation and they begin to ascend up into heaven, into the clouds. Little kids sort of like they're weeping and saying, Mama, please don't go. Daddy, please don't go. Take us with you. Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's the children that are slowly losing their gravitation because they know Jesus. And that they are uh, being uh, wept for because mom and dad are, are left behind. But you understand there's a Greek word for this. That's hogwash. You know, this is not taught in the word of God. You understand that, that this leaving is something that is, that is very secretive. You understand that it comes like a thief in the night. You understand it is a time when nobody knows what is going to happen, when nobody's going to see what is going to transpire, what is going to take place. Jesus gave a parable about ten virgins. He said five of them were wise and five of those were foolish. 
And when Jesus came, there were some, five, that was ready to meet him, and there were others that had to go out and buy some oil. And Jesus mentioned unto him, he said, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is going to come. Nobody knows. It is a secret. I do not know. You do not know. And yet William, William Miller, a pastor in 1843, convinced his congregation that Jesus was going to come in that year. He convinced them that they needed to sell all of their goods that they have, buy some white clothes, sit on the mountaintop waiting for Jesus to come. Jesus didn't come in 1843. So he recalculated and said, it's 1844, I'm sorry. They said and waited another year. Jesus did not come. Nobody knows when Jesus is going to come. Yet as recent as 1988, Edward Wisenhunt, a NASA scientist, began to calculate and wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Going to Come in 1988. Jesus didn't come in 1988. He didn't come in 1989. He did not come in 1990. No one knows when Jesus is going to come. Believe it or not, Jesus doesn't even know when he is going to come. When Jesus was speaking on this subject in Mark chapter 13, verse number 32, Jesus says, but of that day and hour knoweth no one. He said, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. There is one entity that only knows when the end of time is going to be and the rapture of the church is going to take place. And it is God the Father. Jesus is sitting there. The world is progressing normally. Angels are going through heaven crying, holy, holy, holy. And all of at once, God tells Gabriel to get his trumpet and tells Jesus to go get his church. And then that is when the trumpet is going to sound. Jesus is going to appear. The dead in Christ are going to rise. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But until that time, it is a secret no one knows. But we understand not only is it scriptural and not only is it a secret, but it is a sudden event. Jesus was using Paul to write unto the Corinthian church and he was writing, Paul said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Paul gave an indication that there would be some saints of God that would be alive when Jesus would come, and that they were going to be changed or they were going to be raptured in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Well, how long is this expanse of time? What is the chrono chronology for all of this? We understand that he said it is going to be in the twinkling of an eye. Now, all of us realize that we have an involuntary set of eyelashes that, that just, just blink and they clear our eyes and they water those so that we won't be irritated. It is something we don't have to practice. It is not something that we have to learn. And there are those who received over a billion dollars in federal aid to find out how long that took. Now that's our federal government at work. That's your tax dollars. Hey, we are to all applaud and say, hey man, we, we just couldn't hardly wait until we knew that. You understand that what they surmised is that it takes one twentieth of a second for us to do that. Now, I know all of you are going to go home. You're going to pick up the phone, call Grandmama. Say, Grandmama, guess what I learned at church today? So we can all blink our eyes at one twentieth of a second. Well, in one twentieth of a second, we're going to be here, then we're going to be gone. In the length of time, it takes you to blink your eyes. But Paul said it's going to take a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, how long is a moment? It is an interesting word that Paul would use. It's a word that we're all familiar with. It is the word atom, A-T-O-M. Now we understand because of physics and science that until 1945 that an atom was the smallest particle of matter. That when you got matter or substance so small that you could not divide it, then that was called an atom. That is what we are composed of. That's what bricks are made out of and steel and all this. They're made up of atoms, the smallest particle of matter. And Paul used that same term to define the time it would take for the rapture to take place. 
He said, in an atom, a moment of time, a time so small that you cannot divide it, is how long it's going to take for us to get from here to in the arms of the Lord Jesus. You understand that I can divide one twentieth of a second. I graduated from Corner High School in 1961, and, and they taught me simple mathematics. One fortieth of a second is half of one twentieth. One eightieth of a second is half of a one fortieth. One hundred and sixtieth of half of an eightieth, and you can go on and on and on. And when you get to where you can't divide that anymore, that's how long it's going to take for the rapture to take place. Faster than you can blink your eye, faster than I can snap my fingers, you're going to be here and suddenly you're going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Airplanes are going to fly, pilots that are safe are going to be gone and no one is going to recognize uh, where they went, how long it took them to leave. You will understand that little, little guys that know Jesus will be gone, moms and dads that know Jesus will be gone. You understand that every person that is a member of God's church is going to be gone, and, and it's going to be so instantaneous that no person will be able to comprehend it. No person will ever see it happen. The lost person will be talking to a saved person and then figure out the lost person has been talking to himself. They're just gone. They're with the Lord Jesus Christ caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Now you understand that when we talk about spiritual things, when we talk about biblical things, it isn't any importance unless it's significant. You know, to think about Noah and that boat, it has to have some kind of significance, not 6,000 years ago, but something that is present and applicable to you and I, who are sitting here at First Baptist Church Hayden, Alabama in the 21st century. It has to have some kind of rhyme or it has some kind of reason. An illustration that happened to me when I was at Southeastern Bible College and I was in a, a preaching class that is called homiletics. The, the, the professor would sit in a, in, in a video booth and he would record what I was saying, make comments on that recording and video it. And I had preached a little short devotional, that's all the time we had. And when I got through, he stuck his little head out the video booth window and said, So what? I said, I don't know. And he looked at me again and he said, So what? And it took about three so what's to realize that all I had done is just shared information. And that I did not make it applicable to anybody that was sitting there in that homiletics class. And sometimes we as preachers are guilty of taking up 30, 35 minutes of your time and you leave and say, well, how did that apply to me? What did you say all that for? Well, let me tell you what I'm saying all this. Because you understand that the rapture of the church is a scriptural thing that is secretive, that is going to be very sudden, but it has significance to you and to me. It has significance to those who are believers, who, for those who know the Lord Jesus Christ, because of two things. First of all, it is our source of motivation. Every time the Apostle Paul would write about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, he would always put a little codicil, something on the end of it, that made it applicable, something that made it worthwhile to know. And he said to those folks as he wrote about the resurrection and the rapture, in 1 Corinthians, he said, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. He said, In light of the second coming of Jesus Christ, always abounding in the work of the Lord, not getting some white robe, sitting on the top of some mountain, waiting for Jesus to come, but get down in the trenches where lost people live and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, and work because the night was coming when nobody could work. Do what needs to be done. We understand that God has called us and left us to be witnesses here and that the closer that the day of the Lord is, the more that we are to be working for the Lord Jesus Christ. Be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. But not only is our source of motivation, it's our source of consolation. When he got through writing to the church at Thessalonica, he said to them, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. That there is consolation, there is comfort in the fact that Jesus is going to rapture the church out. 
You understand that the early church was a persecuted church. When God had told them to go into all the world and spread the gospel, what did they do? They decided to stay in Jerusalem because, boy, having a great revival here. Boy, you are to go to our church. We're having thousands saved every Sunday. God told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. They didn't go. So God brought persecution upon them. And when the persecutions came, it was like the water that was being scattered out of your hand when you hit it. They went into all parts of the world. They, they were spreading the gospel. Those people that were left in Jerusalem were undergoing such persecutions. There were people in Rome that claimed to be Christians and they were there in, in the time of, of the days when, when, when that great Colosseum was there and, and they would be put into lions, in the Colosseum with lions, gladiators would come, they would be tied to horses going in the opposite direction and as they was walking down that gangplank and they were fixing to step into the arena, the, the, the voice would cry from the front, hope, brother. And they would pass that down, hope. Hope, hope. What was the hope that they had? What was the consolation? They were fixing to be eaten by lions or wild dogs or something. The hope was the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand that's been the hope of every generation. That has been the consolation for you and me. It's as this world gets worse and worse and worse, our hope is in nothing less than Jesus Christ. You understand that Jesus is our hope, that he is going to come again. This became a reality in our life several years ago. When we were at the hospital, Linda's mother was going to have surgery, and they had already given her one of those I don't care shots. And all the family had gathered around hoping we could find out some family secrets because sometimes that affects you know. And as the family was gathered around and we were talking with her, there was a preacher rather indignantly walked in and said, y'all are going to have to leave now. I have something to say to this lady in the bed next to her. Well, that sort of flew against my grain, being, being as angelic as I can be. I can sometimes let my halo grow horns if it wants to. So, so some of the family left, and I was determined not to leave my precious mother-in-law there who with impending surgery all by herself. That preacher just came and indignantly grabbed that little cloth and that separated us from the bed next to us. And me being as sweet and as kind as I could be, I backed up as close to that curtain as I could because I wanted to hear what was so, so important that my mother-in-law's family would have to leave. And the preacher said words about this crash and about this tackle. Doctors have sent me in here to tell you that you have an inoperable brain cancer. There's not anything that they can do. And so I want to have prayer with you. He said one of those little poly want cracker prayers. Stormed out the door. Looking at me rather indignantly as he walked by. And I sat there, still backed up against that curtain. And I listened to this woman in that bed next to us. And she went... Well, this went on for several minutes. And finally, I went around to her, slid the curtain back, and I asked her, I said, Ma'am, I couldn't help but hear what he said to you. And I couldn't. I was real close to that curtain. <laughs> and I said, I'd like to ask you something. She said, yes. I said, do you know Jesus is your personal Savior? And she said, I sure do. Amen. And I said, I got some good news for you then. And she began to share with me where she was saved and, and, and the church that she belonged to and all that had gone on in her life in her 80-something years of knowing Jesus. I said, the good news is that you may not have to die. This could be the day that Jesus comes again. And I said, if this is the day that Jesus comes again, you don't have to worry about the undertaker. The upper taker is going to take care of all of our problems. And I quoted this scripture to her, that we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I left that lady with the consolation, with the hope, that things weren't really as dark as they appeared to be at that moment. Now, I don't know what you are going through, and I don't know everything about you, but I do understand that there are some potholes in the road of life. There are some real crooked turns sometimes. 
And sometimes we face things that we wish we really didn't have to face. But I want to tell you that one day we won't have to face them anymore. One day Jesus is going to come. And in the rapture of the church, folks, it's going to all be over. And we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And we are going to be there in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that's what's important today. is for you to understand that there is hope when it appears that there is no hope. There is a silver lining to that dark cloud in your life. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And it is not another train headed your way. It's Jesus who is coming again. But not only is it significant to the saints of God, it's going to be significant to those that are sinners. You understand it's going to have importance because those people are going to be left behind. Several years ago, when my son was about nine years old, Linda and I took him to a moving picture show along with Lydia, and we saw a movie, I think it was Herbie the Love Bug. That's probably the last one we ever went to. David was nine, and he thought he was 19. And we kept telling him, son, it's crowded. Would you just keep up? Well, when he walked outside the movie theater, he looked, and, and, and he saw all of those billboards of the coming attractions. And I said, David, come on. And he didn't come on. So me and Linda, we just walked, and we just hid in the shadows. And for about five minutes, he looked at those billboards. And then he looked around to find John and Linda but he couldn't see us anywhere. Listen, I can remember that day like it was yesterday. I really kind of wish I hadn't done it. I saw a terror and a fear come over that little boy like I've never seen in any human being. We stepped out of the shadows very quickly, and boy, it changed in, 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 in an instant. But it's still embedded in my mind the fact that our little boy thought he had been left behind. You understand that when Jesus comes, there is going to be a group of people that are going to be left behind. And they're going to be left behind for what I call a living hell. The Bible says that after the rapture of the church, there is going to come a tribulation period such as never been on this earth before. It is going to be a time that is so terrible and so horrendous that the Bible says except the days be shortened, there would be no flesh saved. The Bible tells us that there are four horsemen of the apocalypse that are going to come. There's going to be wars. There's going to be famine, pestilence, disease, starvation. There are going to be things that are going to come that will be so horrendous that it is hard to imagine or hard to describe. The Bible says there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, the stress of nations with perplexities, the seas and the waves roaring, and men's hearts failing them for fear. I was preaching this one time, and I just stopped, and I said, do you know what it means for men's hearts to fail them for fear? And someone in the congregation spoke up and said, they'll be scared to death. I said, that's absolutely right. They will be so terrified that their heart will quit beating. They will be literally scared to death. The Bible says in the book of the Revelation that there will be captains and mighty men and strong men and peasants and all of these that will run to the mountains and they will run into the caves and cry for the mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face of the wrath of the Lamb of God who sits on the throne. Listen, can you imagine a time that, that the events are so horrendous and so horrible that people will literally be scared to death? I did some arithmetic in the book of the Revelation. I've studied it over and over and over and over again. Not sure that I understand all of it, but I do understand this. If I can do mathematics correctly, over three quarters of this world's population will die during the tribulation. Three quarters of this world's population. Do the math. There are seven billion people living in this world today. Five billion, almost five billion of those people are going to die during the tribulation period. It is going to be so hindry, uh, uh, horrendous that they won't even have graves in which to bury those people. They will just lay out on the streets, dead from famine, dead from disease, dead from the plagues of God that are falling out of heaven to, to consume and to devour as His wrath is poured out. It's going to be a literal hell here on earth. A living hell where people have to go through. The Bible says they will gnaw their tongues from pain. But not only is it going to be a living hell, the ultimate end result is going to be a literal hell. 
The Bible says that in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Jeremy, a couple of weeks ago, preached on the subject of hell. It's not a very popular thing, but I want to tell you it's a very, very real thing that those people that do not know Jesus and experience that great tribulation will be lost and consumed in their own sin ultimately to die and to be banished from the presence of God in a lake of fire that burns with brimstone and they will be tormented there forever and forever and forever. Not only will they go through a, a living hell, they'll go through a literal hell for all of time and all of eternity. Why it is significant to those folks. You understand it is a real thing. Several years ago, 1938, on October the 30th, on a Halloween night, there was a man by the name of Orson Welles did a dramatic presentation or portrayal of an attack from outer space. It was broadcast on the CBS radio network at that particular time. You understand, for the first two-thirds of this 62-minute presentation, Orson Welles presented a series of simulated news bulletins that suggested to all of his listeners that there was actually an attack of Martians. An alien invasion was currently in, in progress. Throughout that 62-minute broadcast, they kept putting a little note in there that this was just a dramatic portrayal. It wasn't really happening. And yet there was a young seminary student, a young Bible college student at Campbell College in North Carolina that heard that presentation. And folks, it is as real as real can be in that presentation. He listened to that, began to weep, and began to fear, picked up the phone and called his mama. And he said, Mama, the fire is falling. The end is coming. And I'm not ready to meet God. Well, you can imagine, after everybody found out that this wasn't a real thing, it was just a dramatic portrayal of something that was on the radio. They began to laugh and to scorn and to make fun. The next day they went to the chapel. And in that chapel service, one of the professors got up and said, Hey, I hear that after Orson Welles did his thing last night, there was a guy that called his mother and said, Mama, the fire is falling, the end is coming, and I'm not ready. And that whole place began to just roar with laughter. After that rioter had died down, he looked at him. He said, If this was real, he said, Would you have been ready? It's important. To understand that if you're going to beat God, you need to be ready. You understand if the rapture is going to take place, and it is, you need to be ready. Preparation is made. You as saints of God, you understand that everything that might hurt or harm or hinder in your life, everything that is ugly and distorted and twisted and warped, you need to have that right before God, before the rapture of the church takes place and you stand face to face with Jesus. If you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not ready to meet Him. You're going to be one of those that are going to be left behind. And you're going to recall all the words that you've heard that preachers preached and all the invitations that's ever been given inviting you to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Would it, but it will be of no avail. You're left behind. Like he said to those five virgins, he said, I don't know who you are. I don't know you. And the door has been closed on your salvation experience. And you're doomed to live in a devil's hell. You have an opportunity today to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have an opportunity to come during the invitation and bow before God and say, God, would you save me in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? And have the assurance that if the rapture were to take place, that you would go to be with the Lord Jesus. And that you wouldn't be one of those that are left behind. Maybe you hear and you as a saint of God, you have a friend or a co-worker or a schoolmate, a loved one, that you know of 
that does not know Jesus as your Savior. You know, God has put an imperative for us to be busy, to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We need to tell them before it's too late.